Welcome to the EMT Pro Podcast, where we deliver relevant EMS content from the field in the classroom each week. Episodes of this podcast can get you one full hour of CE through our partner, emt-ce.com. So head over there for more information. Today, we have a really fun episode. Uh, got Dan and Holly with me as usual, and then we have our medical director, Ramsey Selback. Excited to have you here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so, Doc, tell us about your background and why... How did you get into emergency medicine of all fields? Oh, that's, we're going way back. Yeah. We're going way yeah, back, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I guess part, I did a emergency, I was an emergency scribe before I went to med school. So like I was telling you before, I was a tennis bum for a while, taught tennis, got a job in an ER as a scribe in the legacy system in Portland. And that was kind of, the, I guess, one of the first times I was like, really clicked that it was a fun environment to work and got to know the docs real well. Did that for two years and was pretty hooked after that. So applied to med school in Portland. So I did all my training at OHSU, did med school at OHSU, and then I was pretty much like knew I was going to do emergency medicine throughout med school. Tried to convince myself of some other things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, ultimately that was kind of my first experience in emergency medicine and then did residency at OHSU as well. And then I did an ultrasound fellowship. Um, kind of cap everything off yeah yeah dang so oregon's really been yeah pretty much everything for yeah you, which is pretty base. rare right uh yeah you don't is. see people do everything kind of all in the same pretty, state usually, right? yeah it's pretty rare for me it was you know i had like a kid when i was in med school and family and stuff like that so yeah it was motivating for me um we i did like a away in at uc irvine i worked there for a month during med school but yeah mostly just in oregon Nice. So homegrown. Homegrown. Yeah. Right on. So before we dive into stuff too much with chasing numbers, which is what we're going to be talking about, um, we do want to make a general announcement that while we're going to be talking about specifics that we've seen done in the field, both correct and incorrect, and in the ER, both correct and incorrect, um, obviously follow your own local protocols. This isn't a substitute for any of that. So Absolutely. Um, but Dan, you were you and Holly were the ones that, had this idea for an episode. Why don't you guys explain what we got going on today? Well, this is something I see a lot with the newer folks <clears throat> and even some of the older folks and even myself I've done it is I'll get fixated on a number whether it's a vital sign, um, sat, and tidal or something and I will chase that number. I, will, I have to fix that number. If that end title is 74, I have to get that down. That's my job to get it down when actually it's not. I just need to start working towards that. And so we teach a lot and they, they see a heart rate that's too low, even though the blood pressure is fine, they want to treat it um, because that's what we're taught. We're taught to, there are certain numbers, that, parameters that we have. And, and I think we just should get a doctor's perspective on some of this. Because mm-hmm. there's going to be times where, quote unquote, chasing their vitals is a good thing. Right. And then there's a lot of times where it's we just not a good time mm-hmm. and just leave it alone. Right. And, you know. And I'd like to say, too, it's not just the newer people either. It's, it's um, If you've been doing this for one year or 10 years or 20 years, you do always kind of find yourself trying to get everything into that parameter you're comfortable with mm-hmm. um, back into the normal zone. And even when we were flying, it's really easy to go pick someone up from one place that is can use a lot of improvement. Mm-hmm. And the most fun thing is to have them all fixed up and packaged perfectly when you arrive at the receiving yes. facility. Um, and we can really get into that and it makes mm-hmm. us feel good because yep. now we drop them off and they've got a good blood pressure and yay, right. um, except sometimes we make it worse. So those are some of the things. And it looks know. good on our chart, right? Yeah. If my numbers are through in this, this area where yeah. they're supposed to be, it looks real good on my chart. Well, and with everything we do, we're always asked that question. Did they improve? You yeah, know, right. Like, right. when you chart it, <laughs> right. it's like, the well, shoot, you know, I'm not looking for an improvement right now. I'm looking to just maintain, right? And so, you know, selecting that no change or whatever the... Well, sometimes you just get them off the bathroom floor in the back of the ambulance to the hospital. That's an improvement, even if your numbers are still the same. Yeah. 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 I think it's super contextual. Mm -hmm. Often, I mean, for the most part, keeping them within those parameters, like is the right thing to do right but not always <laughs> right and like see you know knowing what the specific situation you're dealing with is important right and ha- being able to step back and be comfortable with a number that you might be uncomfortable with sometimes is the right thing to do mm-hmm. and that takes 
some practice. Some practice, yeah, yeah and a lot of critical thinking, mm -hmm. thinking outside the box and what's going to happen next. Um, and like you said, getting comfortable in that uncomfortable zone. Yeah. So, and obviously we're going to be painting with a little bit of a broad brush today, but why don't we start with talking about when we should chase numbers? What are some good ideas for when we're looking at vitals and we go, oh, we need to make an improvement on those between when we have them on scene and when we get them to the hospital? Okay. We'll start with uh, blood pressure. Yeah. That's one we always go on, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the issues we see a lot with the new people are they, they, they don't understand what a MAP is. Mm -hmm. You know, the mean arterial pressure. They want to know the diastolic and the systolic, the, the systolic and the diastolic. Mm -hmm. and, and just calculating a map, and I'm sure you're going to put something up on the post on how to do that, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. You want to re repeat that for us, Dan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Holly knows. Systolic plus two times the diastolic. God, you're so goddamn smart. Over three? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> two thirds, one third. Yep. Yep. And most, um, most monitors, monitors are going to yep. give you the map. And of right. course, it's a it's a non invasive map, so it's not as good as if it was a central line right. or something. But right. it's something mm -hmm. to work toward. Right. Yeah. So when you say that, like, if my blood pressure actually this morning was like eighty nine over fifty six, because I've been checking it in the mornings. Um, but you know what? My map was okay, and right. I, it, it's debatable whether or not I'm perfusing my brain. But <laughs> that's what the map is for. You have to have a map of at least 60 or 65, hopefully, to perfuse the brain, ideally like 70. Um, but in our trauma patients, what are we looking for? Like a map of 65? Yeah. 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 And again, that like if they're septic and you know they're in septic shock, then yeah, getting their map you know, 65-ish is great sometimes it's hard to do that yeah. and if it's a little 90 year old 90 pound lady you know their her blood pressure is probably normally mm -hmm. in the 80s over 50s right or 90s over 50s so throwing a bunch of pressure at somebody right. unnecessarily isn't always great i mean the big honestly one of the big things too that i see all the time in the er is this is their blood pressure the first thing i do is Say let's re let's recheck it. Yeah, with the monitor, and if we don't like that blood pressure, we're rechecking it with a manual. Exactly. And I don't know, eighty percent of the time you get a better reading or a different reading. Mm -hmm. And the amount of times that I've come into work and you know we get, especially now. So I work in Astoria for the podcast in a mm -hmm. critical access hospital, and we're sitting on critical patients for like mm -hmm. twelve hours sometimes. So we're dealing with a lot of stuff that we used to ship quick. But I'll come to work and people will be on maxed out epi for a, a blood pressure of X, Y, or Z, and we're not getting a good reading. And I'll put an art line in that person and their pressures are through the roof. Yeah. And now I can like almost peel back the presser. Like uh, that's happened multiple times this year where I'm like, well, we need less than half of the epi that we're giving them or the nor epi or whatever. So getting an accurate reading is like half the battle, Yes. I think. And critically thinking. Yeah, look at that patient. Yeah. So right. in the field, then we have non-invasive blood pressures. Um, just throw a blood pressure cuff on and mm -hmm. see what it is, and hopefully mm -hmm. hope for the best. Um, we have manual blood pressure cuffs in the field, yep. and then once you get in the hospital setting, you have the central lines um, or A lines mm -hmm. or whatever um, to really accurately measure that blood pressure. And that's a really good thing to know that some your non-invasive pressures might be lower than your central pressures, or the other way around sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so. Have you guys seen, there's a, a new feature on the monitors now, it's, I think Zoll calls theirs turbo cuff, but it, they call it yeah. a poor man's art line, where it's just a constant blood pressure that it's taking yeah. non-invasively. That. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's as close as we're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, good for you. But I mean, to your point, like look at your patient. Yeah. If they're sitting up and they're talking and they have no complaints and their blood pressure is 80 over 50 or 90 over 50, like... Don't what freak else? out yeah. mm -hmm. and like don't throw a presser at them and make their blood pressure something that it shouldn't be. You know, if they look fine, mm -hmm. you know, if they're altered and sick and febrile, blah, 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 like different story, right? right? Mm -hmm. But just one number is not something to get too crazy about. And that's a good and point. So if they have a low blood pressure, we expect to see a high heart rate if there's something that needs to be corrected or maybe yes, they're breathing yeah. fast or their skin doesn't look well or they're diaphoretic. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what other Do you well, look a lot at shock index? Um, yes, 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 and no. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's uh, your guys' job is crit like so much more difficult than people realize because it's like you've got somebody in the back of a rig or on a helicopter or in their house, and you have this limited amount of time. Like I don't know your transport time average is, but let's say thirty minutes to an hour. Max. Not not where we not are. even probably yeah. So We're you have this like super short amount of time where like just gathering the information to figure out what's going on mm -hmm. takes that long. Yeah. And then you're expected to intervene on some number, right, or right. some vital sign right. that looks out of line. I mean, it's, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it happens quick, and you can potentially make decisions that, most of the time, that are great, right? You know, somebody's hypotensive and they need fluid, you give them fluid, but maybe they're hypotensive and they're in cardiogenic shock, mm -hmm. and you give them fluid and... Now they're worse off, right? Mm -hmm. so, right. But that's a that's a hard thing to figure out in a short amount of time, right? When you're in, in pre-hospital setting, and not all the answers are in that protocol book. No, <laughs> <laughs> I wish they yeah. were. Yeah, I mean, you guys touched on heart rate though, and I think that's the one. Maybe end title is up there too, but heart rate seems to be like probably I would say the number one thing that people get wigged out about. Whether it's too high or too low, and yeah. when to treat it. Yeah. Because um, we were just giggling a minute ago. Giggling is maybe not the right word, but uh, laughing about how, like, when you're in an ER and you're looking at the telehealth boards with just the ECGs on them, so many times you're like, oh my gosh, if I had that right now on a call, I would be. Why isn't someone yeah. talking yes. about that? Yeah. Giving them a drip <laughs> or pacing them or yeah. defibrillating or something. And. They've been in the ER like that for hours. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Or days. Yeah. I had a person yeah. in a complete heart block with a heart rate of 22 to 26 mm -hmm. for 12 hours the other day. And he was fine. Just mentating. Mentating oh. great. His blood pressures were like in the 140s. No, completely asymptomatic. And wow. this was a discussion my entire shift. Mm -hmm. Like, do, do we need to give this guy epi? Do we need to pace <laughs> this guy? Right. You know, and the answer was no, because he was doing fine. And sometimes you don't want to rock the boat. And we don't have transcutaneous, or sorry, transvenous pacing mm -hmm. in Astoria. So it's like you're going to transcutaneously pace somebody. That's a long time. Dramatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so are you at that point just waiting for him to get a pacemaker place? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. At that point, we're just waiting on uh, someone to a open bed up. in the to clear. somewhere. <laughs> right. Well, right now it's a bit, right now it's a bed issue. Or yeah. the, but mm -hmm. you know, we're sending people all over the place. Yeah. yeah, I know our local trauma center, we've been sitting there sometimes for up to two hours yeah. just waiting to drop a patient off right now. And then more commonly, you know, people are funny. They'll, they'll, call, they'll call 911 thinking they get a yeah. faster response. Yeah. And so now we're being told, like, no, let us know if, if it's triageable on your HERA report. And then a doc will meet us at the doors and be like, uh, you know, do a quick once over mm -hmm. and be like, yeah, just... Let them go hang out in triage for a little bit. Yeah. So you get an ambulance your, bill and, yeah. a, <laughs> and you get to wait four hours for your room. But but to your point, like that is uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable for me, yeah. too. It's is uncomfortable for everyone. Yeah. 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 At any moment, this kid. I'm going to pace this guy. He's going to stop breathing. He's gonna, his blood pressure is going to tank. Yeah. And it's you know more uncomfortable for like the nursing staff. And I'm you know I've already talked to cardiologists about this patient, et cetera. And they're like, well... They're more comfortable with it than I am, right? Because mm -hmm. that's their gig. Mm -hmm. So they're like, "Yeah, just leave them alone. It's fine." I'm like, but sure. you have everything yeah, sure. all set and ready to go. Yeah, just yeah. I case. mean, the pads are yeah. on, everything's yeah. on, of course. But yeah. like, mm -hmm. it, it, ab abnormal vitals that are that out of line are anxiety provoking. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. so, yeah. But we were saying earlier, like, I'm not going to pace that guy to treat my anxiety. Right. 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 Yeah. Or VTAC is the other stable VTAC. I always think that's a funny yeah. thing mm -hmm. to say because it's not going to be stable for long, but it actually can be. Yeah. And just having people in VTAC just hanging out. Yep. You know, I want to do something so bad. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, they sit there for an hour or two. and. So uh, we talked about low heart rates. We just touched on high heart rates. How about saturations right now? I got well, one on saturations. Yeah. Before we move on from high heart rates, um, one thing that trips people up a lot, I've seen in the ER a lot, I saw it in the flight world a lot too, and our medical director was always kind of trying to pound it into our heads. If you have a patient that's an AFib or with RVR, mm -hmm. right, um, 
are they dehydrated? What's their blood pressure? Is it truly RVR or are they just tachycardic and happen to have AFib? So, you know, making sure that you find out what the underlying problem is before you go ahead and start treating that with, you know, diltiazem or whatever you have. Yep. Um, because that can make things a lot worse too. So chasing those numbers too, in that sense, um, we see all these trigger points. Uh, bradycardia, tachycardia, mm -hmm. RVR, you know, all these things. And we have things in our toolbox to yeah. fix them, mm -hmm. and we really want to use them. Yeah. Um, but really finding out what's that underlying cause there. Maybe yes. they're just, um, you need some fluids. We, and do, we do that with theatrics all the time, right? Yeah. You know, they've got a fever, they're in pain, and their heart rate's super high, and now we think it's SVT, and let's yeah. treat and that. And also, we're there, so they're nervous. Right, yeah, um, right. And so that can also be part of the tachycardia, too. Like with trauma patients and tachycardia, Yeah. Um, maybe they're just scared. Mm -hmm. yeah. They're in a helicopter or they're in an ambulance or they're in an ER. Yeah, they're in pain. Um, so finding out what that tachycardia really is coming from is a right. really important um, thing to think about too. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, especially with the AFib because yeah. that's one that gets over treated a lot mm -hmm. and it's like somebody who's euroseptic or something and then you're beta blocking them and that's an, it's an appropriate reflex tachycardia yeah. that you're now right. blunting. Yeah. And it's Which is not just good. tachycardia. Yeah, and so many people have AFib. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the, yes. pop, the amount of AFib in the population is crazy. So it's like, if they're tachycardic and they have underlying AFib, make sure to figure out why they're tachycardic. It's right. a great point. Yeah. Holly, you're so smart. She is. Very smart. Um, saturations. Saturations. One that drives me crazy is uh, you've got a patient, maybe a GCS of five or six, and they're sat at 100%. Okay, we're fine. Let's get them to the hospital. To me, that I don't even look at that saturation. I looked at what's going to happen to this patient once I arrive at the hospital. What's going to happen in route to the hospital? Are they going to throw up? You know, are they going to mm -hmm. aspirate? And so that's one when, when I don't care about that high number, yeah. right? I want to treat the patient. The patient cannot protect their own airway. So yeah. let's let's not worry. Let's not be you know super happy that we have a sat of 100%, right? So. Mm -hmm. That's one of my big pet peeves. And they, t I mean, they talk about good reasons to intubate include can't ventilate, can't oxygenate, but it doesn't have to be both. Correct. Um, and I think it's going to depend on provider comfort level of taking that airway in that specific example. Um, I've definitely had crews where we were more comfortable doing that than some weren't. But yeah, um, yeah, I think that's a good point. What else so you're on? saying that even though their SATs are good, they still might need to be intubated. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, the, you know, the teaching is like, you know, GCS of eight or less intubate, right? Right. But it's not always perfect. Like if, right. there's a, if they're right. quickly reversible right. for their altered state. But yeah, I know if somebody's got a GCS of five, yeah. even though they're satting well, like they probably need a tube, Yeah. you know? Yeah. So what other vital signs would you check before doing that? Sugar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's why his GCS yeah. is four. That's one thing yeah. that I think gets missed too. Um, oh. Any ultra yeah. mild SATs, of course, we're going to check a blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look at those pupils. Maybe it's an overdose, right? Right. Yeah. 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 Pupils could be an overdose. So, entitled blood pressure. Well, I yeah. guess you won't have an entitled yet, but you'll, you might have the nasal cannula. Nasal cannula. Yep. Mm -hmm. CO2. Yes. What would you right. expect? Someone on a GCS of five, I mean, I would expect their CO2 to be high. Like maybe they're not ventilating enough, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. their SATs are still fine. Yeah. So they're getting amp oxygen. There's nothing wrong with their lungs. You see, and I think your question, though, is a perfect point because if I'm seeing that, I am going to expect their end title to be high. But then my earliest training was cool. When you see that high end title, start breathing really fast for them to help them breathe it off so that you can feel better about getting their numbers to a healthier range. And I think at face value, like that can get people in a lot of trouble. Because, yeah. um, I mean, I, I jokingly said check a sugar, but I was thinking hypoglycemia. But if their GCS is four and their sugars reads high on your mm -hmm. monitor, yeah. you know, that's a totally different uh, scenario. But yeah. Yeah, and DKA, as a, just generally, if they're in DKA, they're breathing fast to breathe off that right. acidosis that metabolically they're they're trying to obtain compensate. all that homeostasis. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to compensate. And maybe that's not the patient RSI. 
Absolutely. Even though they have a blood pressure of four, you know, maybe if I have a good positioning, good suctioning, good uh, airway techniques, I mean, because if they have an end tidal of 17, they're breathing at a rate of 40. If I intubate them and now I'm breathing at a rate of 18 and I want to mm -hmm. get their SATs up, they're breathing that off for a reason. I mean, the, yeah. the patients that still scare me to intubate to this day are people with really bad DKA because it's hard to match that on a vent. Yeah. yeah. And really, really bad asthmatics. Yes. And like aspirin overdoses. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, those are all. So, I mean, yeah, in the field, if you have somebody with DKA that's like borderline needing a tube, I would resuscitate the heck out of them mm -hmm. before. First. Yeah. And if you drive. Could, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, that, it's just a scary tube. Yeah. You know. And let's talk about if we are in the field, we have limited access, right? We don't have ABGs, so we don't know what yep. their bicarb is, but we do have an end title. Yep. Um, which is like kind of the, the poor man's way to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're going to intubate a DKA patient and you put them on the monitor and their CO2 is 17, what are you going to do once they're intubated? Do you want it to be back up to 35? Absolutely not. I want to keep it right at 17. Yeah. Because that's what's keeping them alive. Mm -hmm. right. right, Doc? Yep. And truly because then you're going to start shifting their pH in the, in the wrong direction. Right. Because right now their body's doing what it needs to do right. to blow off all of that extra, you know, their, their metabolic acidosis. Mm -hmm. So they're blowing off that CO2, trying to um, keep their pH within range and... I don't know if you've seen that happen or how quickly it happens, but I know probably on a regular transport, if we fix that CO2 immediately, by the time 30 minutes goes by, we've probably shifted something in a really bad direction. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the exact timing of that, but yeah. I agree. And the, most of these people are wildly dehydrated, yeah. you know, so getting, I would say the pre -ho the thing to do pre-hospital is like, get fluids on board, right? Like these people, usually if they're in DKA, like obviously all of these things come with a grain of salt, but like if they're a true DKA or they're, you could throw liters at them. Yeah. And that's gonna be the best thing for them pre-hospital, really. If you can avoid a tube. Yeah. I Just, mean, your guys' clinical judgment in the field is good. And if they need it, they need it, but, but yeah. If I mean, they don't. Because it's hard to, to ventilate someone at 40 times a minute, you know, it just is not in our... Unless, no, I mean, yeah. talk through that. Why why is it difficult to put someone on a vent that you've just intubated with DK and they're entitled 70? I'm sorry, 17. 17. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what's going on? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, ask me the question one more time. I'm so sorry. explain, I guess there's going to be people who maybe have never used a vent right. on an intubated patient or people who have never intubated this specific type of patient, Right. why would operating a vent for this specific type of patient be a difficult challenge? Well, I mean, if you look at us right now, we're breathing 10 to 12 times a minute, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I still see this when we set ventilators up. We will set that ventilator up even with an, you know, you've got the, the HME, you've got the tubing, you've got the entitled, you've got all this, this, this dead space that we're not compensating for, and we still put it at 12 times a minute. And so we're not getting our minute volume like we should mm -hmm. be getting. And then you add the thing where they are, their pH is, is so low, um, they're breathing at 40 times a minute to blow that acid off. And w our comfort zone is, okay, we'll go 12 to 18, somewhere in there. And now you're, just like Holly said, we're increasing that, that acid. And so it's just super hard to set that vent at 36 times a minute. Mm -hmm. Right, it's going to be something that is going to require a lot of hands-on, a lot of hands-on, changing stuff. Yes, yeah, and it's a good time to call a doctor. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's yeah. hard to meet to match their metabolic needs mm -hmm. and it their is. metabolic demands, and their their if they if they don't need a tube, their body will do a better job at that than a yes, vent, mm -hmm. generally speaking. Yes, you know, it's it's hard, and then even if they're if you get them on a vent with the right settings. Like 36 to 40 breaths a minute on a vent is crazy fast. Yeah. And then you can run into like breath stacking and yes. all these other complications. Right. You would have to def you would have to have them completely sedated or maybe mm -hmm. even paralyzed mm -hmm. depending on what you, what you want to do there. But. Yeah. Are RSI drugs going to mess even further with some of what they're dealing with? Um, well, yeah, because it's, again, like you're now taking away all of their respiratory drive mm -hmm. and ability to breathe. So yeah. you're gonna have to immediately match that. Mm -hmm. And like every 
minute that you're not breathing at that rate they were breathing, they're just getting more acidotic. Yeah. You know, they're now getting a respiratory acidosis in addition to their metabolic acidosis, and they're just not compensating like they should be. Yeah. So, um, and then they, you know, if they're that ac acidotic, they may need higher doses of um, paralytics. And I mean, that's a really complicated, yeah, it's so vent, complicated vent patient. Like that is a, that is a. If you have a bad DKR on a vent, like they need to be in an ICU with somebody that really knows what they're doing mm -hmm. with, with vent management. So, quick question for you. So, if they're in the ICU. Are they on like SIMV? I know we're getting into the weeds on ventilator management, but oh, so that yeah. they can they can. They would have so you, you said SIMV. Ex explain that for people. Uh, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. Mm -hmm. So that is a whole other podcast. But yeah, <laughs> and, and, yeah. And vent management is honestly even beyond like from an you know ED scope. Like in a perfect world, we're not doing a lot of vent management, right? Because we're getting this patient out to the, the door, appropriate right. going upstairs person right. in appropriate location. But yes. So I mean, that, for me, that's even more even into the weeds beyond. So are you relying on a good RT and good RT? And I, I mean, if I had that patient in the ED, I would be calling an ICU doc, just mm -hmm. like you'd be calling yeah, us right. to help manage that vent. Because I mean, knowing the patients that you need help with is uh, is important, mm -hmm. right? And like that goes for me, that goes for you guys, it goes for everybody. Like if I had a DK or on a vent, like I would be on the phone immediately mm -hmm. with an ICU doc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I do feel like um, in the flight world, we would transfer those kinds of people quite often. Mm -hmm. And so it is really important to know exactly what you have. And we use something called the Winters Formula, mm -hmm. which um, basically it doesn't work for every patient, I don't think. But in this instance, you know, if you have a recent lab result or have a recent ABG, you can use the bicarb or the CO2 from a lab test, like a blood test. Um, and it's, what is it, one and a half times the bicarb plus eight, plus or minus two. And that's where your end title needs to be. And that might be 17 or 70, depending on what type of patient right. you have. And I felt like that was very helpful if we're picking them up in an in-hospital mm -hmm. setting to see where they should be if they're not Im immediately where they are you know, on the vent, yeah. but maybe where, what our target is for transport. Yes. And knowing a number that you can um, target to, again, is helping. It's outside of our norms, but yeah. now I still have a target that I can right. Um, you know, hopefully um, address my treatment mm -hmm. to achieve that. And, th and I think this goes back to the original point of this conversation is undifferentiated, undifferentiated patient yes. chasing stuff versus a, in this case, let's say a completely differentiated patient, you know exactly what's going on. Right. Now you're chasing a number and that's a totally different conversation, yeah. right? Because that's much more appropriate. Yeah, and even, it feels better. Yeah, <laughs> and it's still maybe hard. It's still maybe yeah. hard to achieve, but like you're chasing something that, like That's you know right. what's going on, yeah. rather than chasing things where you're blindly chasing numbers. Right? I don't know. I think that, that like yeah, for sure, it gets into that is very true. Absolutely. Yeah, That's a good point. I remember something. And I'm gonna again get it wrong, but I remember hearing um, from some docs that I shadowed in school that acute problems should be chased acutely. And chronic problems that took them a long time to get to where they're at today mm -hmm. typically need a long time to get back to their, you know, baseline level. Right. I really that. like that. That's yeah. really good. Yeah. But it was, and so I know we've talked about like trauma patients. That's an acute problem, right? Like mm -hmm. their vitals are tanking because of a traumatic pro of a traumatic, you know, morphol uh, etiology versus this DKA or patient that we're talking about. They've yeah. Spent years getting mm -hmm. to yeah. this point, you know, true. and they probably had a bumpy road along the way. But and yeah. it's like when you look at a VBG of a person who's had COPD for decades, right? Like mm -hmm. they're chronically compensated, and those numbers aren't normal, but they're normal for them, mm -hmm. right? Or you stick your, you know, like I'm an ultrasound guy. Like I stick my ultrasound on somebody's chest, and they have a giant pericardial effusion that is due to a malignancy and has been there for months, right? Mm -hmm. And they're fine. Yeah. Like if you saw a quarter of that size pericardial effusion tr acutely, that person would be in tamponade. Mm -hmm. So like, it's a right. good, you know, like that's a good yeah. example of like this chronic thing that they live with and they're fine and you don't right. need to like stick a needle in their heart versus somebody who <laughs> with that same amount of fluid traumatically or acutely would like not be alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And that's where the critical thinking comes in to all of these. All right. of this. Why are we chasing vitals? Are we? Should we? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, what's the 
the reason we were called? Yes. What did we find? Does it match up? Right. You know, are we aware of why we're trying to change something? Um, yeah, that's good info. And yeah. if you have questions about it, call online medical. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that, that's your backup resource Great all resource. the time. Yeah. And it's always a good, like we all in, in emergency medicine, if I have a vital sign abnormality that I can't explain, it definitely gets my attention, yeah. right? Like if I've got somebody who's persistently tachycardic and I've done a workup and I haven't found a good source for that, like now I kind of need to step back again and be like, okay, like maybe this person has a PE or maybe, you know, maybe there's yeah. something else going on. Yeah. So, you know, it's... You don't want to chase it, and you don't want to ignore it. You don't want to chase it, but you want to like. They're they can help guide you, right? Like vital sign abnormalities, but. Yeah, and I think like the ones that are unconscious with no blood pressure and a head injury, those are easier patients to think about. But Absolutely. the ones where it's like, oh, your blood pressure is fine, but your heart rate's not. Right. Your your heart rate's really low, but you're mentating fine. You know, that's yeah. kind of again going back to that gray area is like. Yeah. In the field, you're you're very compelled to do something because that's what you've been trained to do, and mm -hmm. you feel very scrutinized. Um, but maybe those are the ones where you take a little bit more time and figure out. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. If, you know, the thing that I've been amazed by lately is, oftentimes it won't be my treatment or whatever that helps the hospital out the most. It's the story. If I can get a really thorough background on the patient and that's all I get, they can put so many things in place for oh, when yeah. we drop them off. And the I had a paramedic preceptor and uh, he would tell me, my goal every single time I drop a patient off is to get a thank you for your like great story, like your background. Mm -hmm. That wow, wow, thank wow. you. You know, like that was his goal every single time. And so he would just ask question after mm -hmm. question and he would he would go down rabbit trails as long as he could, you know, trying to find out how the heck did you get to this place that now 911 needs to be called? We're finding you. You've got these vital signs. And maybe we do something about it. Maybe we don't. But um, he said it all came back to knowing, you know, like that, your cog in the wheel, right? Like yeah. we're just one piece of it. And so do your piece really, really well to help yeah. set up the next, you know, layer of care. But it was, it was cool. It's so much different than... You know, sometimes today I hear people put so much pressure on themselves to like correct the one thing they find. Yep. And that's not going to do anything. Yeah. No. It's EMS just going to make you feel better there's temporarily. There's so much opportunity for information gathering. Mm -hmm. like how many steps do they have at home? Mm -hmm. You know, what does it look like? Who, yes. who was there? Did they eat? Is there a house on Let's take a picture and show yeah. the staff. Yeah. Which is that's so an helpful. awesome yeah. thing. Like, you know, yeah. especially in like the little <clears throat> community in these smaller hospitals, you get to know the EMS folks mm -hmm. telling you they often will tell you about the way the house looked and it's why it can be wildly helpful yeah. yeah you know yeah that's a good thing to focus on i'm glad you said that yeah no when i, I think... trained um the new newer nurses in the er that's i would always say like listen to what the paramedics have to say they are telling you something very important that when they leave you're going to want to know exactly so listen to everything they have to say ask them all the questions you want to know don't just transfer the patient over and get started on your tasks and because of, there's so much mm -hmm. huge wealth of information. Yeah, I I went away from it, and then I've recently gone back to it. But just using your glove to make notes, it's so stinking helpful. It is. It helps formulate your story. It helps make sure that the major points are, you know, relayed to the appropriate folks. Um, right on your gloves. That's the best thing mm -hmm. I can tell people. It's so simple, but. It helps yeah. so and much. And we forget that. Guys. And that's what all the new EMT students do. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll go through a scenario and they're sitting there writing and writing. And they, yeah. They're able to do a lot better hand off than I do. Yeah. And honestly, when you, when the charts get written and they get faxed to that magical place in the sky, I've never <laughs> seen an EMS chart in the ER before. Right. I don't know where they go. I don't either. Yeah. So then you can't, I'm sure you take the time to write your narrative, all these other things you saw, but no one really sees it. That's, that's that first like two minute handoff. Where yeah. you get to tell them everything you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. We recently, it's funny you bring that up, we just changed to a system where it's through ESO. We can see the outcome of the patients. Mm -hmm. And so, like, what was ordered, how they responded, we can see all the docs notes on it. Um, oh, wow. But the only way we get that information is if our name was attached to the patient okay. on the chart that was written by EMS. And so it's a pretty cool thing we can do. Having good follow-up. Getting good follow-up from the ER or the doctor or your medical director or whatever your 
EMS chief mm-hmm. is awesome for these types of gray area. Um, do we chase the numbers? Because yeah. then you know what happened to them when they got there. It's yeah. like, oh, they left their heart rate at 20 for three mm-hmm. days. Holy yeah. cow. Right. Yeah. I guess I'm glad I didn't do anything. Exactly. You know, and it kind of makes you feel better about what you did or yep. didn't do. Yep. Once you can find out what happened on the back side. Yeah. Sometimes it's surprising too with mm-hmm. what ended up happening. Yeah, the thing I'm always I mean, I guess we're all kind of intrigued by is how quickly were they discharged? Uh-huh. Um, were they, you know, admitted somewhere else, cardiac ICU or, you know, somewhere How quickly else. were they intubated? Right. Right. And then a uh, fair bit of time we see expired at, you know, yeah. date and time. And that's uh those are always interesting. Well, cool. Dan, I wanted to get into, you had a good case study that you had mentioned. Uh, I did. I'm and a little I embarrassed wanted, by it, but. That's okay. But I don't want to know much more than the fact you were embarrassed by it because <laughs> you're going to do what we did last week where uh, you have all the information, but the three of us are going to ask you questions questions, okay. so that you can, so that listeners can see kind of our thought process a little bit okay, or at least listen to our thought process. And then, um, you know, at the end, give us kind of the summary and. Okay. Lessons learned and everything else. Okay. Uh, so, so what, yeah, just tell us what we're dispatched to. Uh, care home, uh, 74 year old female, uh, unconscious, difficulty breathing, temperature. Difficulty breathing, and she has a temperature? Mm-hmm. Okay. Does she have a DNR? <laughs> no. Good first question. Good, Good question. question. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. 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 So, no DNR. No. She's in a nursing home. She's 74. Yeah, we have a uh, four person truck, two person ambulance. Okay, so you got six people on scene. A small hospital, decent hospital. Okay. In town. Um, and any... I'm about two miles away from the hospital. Yeah, I was going to say, how far out are you? Not two okay. miles. Okay. <laughs> any ongoing stuff with this facility that makes you think this is serious yes. or BS? Uh, this this is one where we get a lot of sick patients out of because okay. there's not the best care that goes on in there, and they wait till the end to call us. Okay. See, this is interesting because that's a question. I wouldn't would have known to ask. Yeah. Like you guys know to ask that. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting, like just me hearing that, that mm-hmm. you guys go to all these yeah. facilities and you know to ask that question. Well, it's, like he just said, sometimes they're they're super quick to pull the yeah. trigger and it's like yeah. you get there and you're like, man, I can't really warrant this. This is a tough yes. reason to yeah. bring someone in on an ambulance for. Or you right. go there and you know that you get a lot of sick patients from this yeah. place. That's interesting. Right. Yeah. 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 We say, with those, we say you show up behind. Like, you're, yeah. You walk in the door and you're like, oh my gosh, yeah, yeah, here we are. Catch up. Mm-hmm. We, we, we got to play catch up. Okay. Cool. Um, so what do we see as we kind of uh, We go in, in uh, the this, this definite smell of a possible UTI. UTI. Okay. Okay. Um, she is very warm to the touch. She's breathing pretty fast, mm-hmm. uh, but very shallow breathing. What's the temp in the room? Is it like... Uh, no, it's it's normal. It's like 70. I swear, half oh, the time sorry. you walk in and it's like 100 degrees. Oh, my gosh. Rooms. It's yeah. horrible. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else do you want to know? responsive at all? Uh, to external rub. She is. Only an external rub. Only an external rub. Mm. Okay. And so, so, so... Yeah. So we immediately... We want her out because the care staff there is... They get in the way a lot. There's patients. There's like two, three patients in the room. So we get her out to the ambulance. Mm-hmm. And something happens in town where we let the truck go, and the, the truck has like three paramedics on it. Okay. So, what should I have done at that point? I'm two miles away from the hospital. Go. <laughs> just yeah. go right. Yeah. IV. Mm-hmm. You do a quick twelve lead, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, no. Okay. Okay. So we park. We turn the motor off. We set up shop. Okay. So it, what did you decide our vitals were? So you're staying uh, in plan. We're staying in plan. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. got stuff to do. Yeah. Uh, blood pressure is in the sixties. Okay. Um, uh, end title is low, so 17. Wait, we didn't do end title yet. Apologies, did a different call. Uh, SATs are low in the 80s. Uh, very decreased lung sounds. Okay. Do you have any medical history on her prior to this? No. No, no. meds, anything yeah. like that? No. Not really. Okay. No. And so immediately you go for sepsis. Right. I mean, Correct. I mean, and we do the have, beginning we... of the call, I was thinking sepsis. Yes. Mm-hmm. But... Correct. And we have lactate on this ambulance. Oh, so, okay. what'd you get? Uh, lactate of four. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah, well. So she's hypotensive. Yep, hypotensive. She's got an elevated lactate. Yep. She's febrile. Rapid breathing. Yep. Yeah, what rapid was her temp? breathing. Temp was 102. Okay. Okay. Is this what? in the COVID era? No. Okay. So pre-COVID. this is pre COVID. Yep. yep. Blood sugar is was like in the 200s. 
So fluids, fluids. Yeah. So you're saying she's in septic shock right now? Septic shock. In your mind, right. basically. De- yep. Yeah. Uh, decreased lung sounds, all fields. Did you have an end title on her na- like nasal cannula? No. Okay. You do not have one. Okay. And so... Honestly, man, I'm just going to s- do a couple IVs, give her some fluid, and... And leave. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, not yet. Okay. No, not yet. <laughs> she has an altered mental status. We're totally going to stay in an debate, aren't we? What's her GCS? I, absolutely. She, uh, four, four to five. Yeah. Okay. So high flow O2. Yep. That's my IVs on board. And then doc for ER, are you guys still doing 30 cc's per kilo or just resuscitation to map? Um, I mean, 30 cc's per kilo is still, the, yeah. Right. But, yeah. you know, that can, again, it's contextual, right? Yeah. Like. Once we get that patient and get a little more history, maybe put an ultrasound on them, they've got evidence of heart failure, then right. obviously we're not going to go that high. But yeah. But we're not going to get that much Yeah, and you're not going to no. get that much in there probably no. anyway. No. Right. So why no. open fluids? Why don't fluids? High flow to um, nasal cannula, high flow to, because we're getting ready to intubate. We're trying to get those stats up. You're trying to optimize the intubation. Correct. Yep. What's the other way to optimize that intubation? I hate that they're hypotensive. Oh, yeah. We, we're, we're prepping the norepi. We have okay. a pump. We have norepi. So we're prepping that. We're going to get that going. So, <laughs> Dan, I'm sorry. You're two miles from the hospital. Two miles from the hospital. And you're going to do That's a why drip. That's he was embarrassed. And you're going to innovate <laughs> yep. in two miles. Yep. God, I got a lot to do. I had Damn. to justify my job, okay? <laughs> you're, yeah. Yeah. you're earning I'm your gonna deal today, it. man. Heavy yeah. traffic day. Yeah. <laughs> Heavy right. traffic. That one, that one stoplight, you yeah. might wait 30 seconds after. Yeah, shoot. I'm sure the Dang. hospital was on divert. And <laughs> I would love to say they yeah. were, but no. Oh, okay, okay. Good doc on board that day. Oh, yep. Okay. Okay. So we get the blood pressure up a little bit. Mm-hmm. It might, takes maybe 10 minutes or so Okay. to get the blood pressure oh, up. Just sitting in the... In the just sitting, just hmm. getting everything prepped because I'm going to innovate this patient. Be so she's <laughs> 60s initially with fluids gets to. Uh, we get up in the 80s, high 80s, high 80s. What are with, her sats now? Sats are in the high 80s. We don't get past I think 89. But remember, she's got decreased lung sounds. Mm-hmm. So, so she might have a pneumonia or something. Uh, Decreased lung sounds like tight, like wheezy lung sounds, or like didn't just hear any wheezes, no, just just didn't hear anything. Which is yeah, almost, yeah, I mean, I could hear a little bit of, of movement, but mm-hmm. I didn't hear any wheezing. Mm-hmm. So, and I didn't get the great medical history where I would have known that this patient might have COPD. Got it. Okay. And she's just shallow breathing. Shallow fast. breathing. Fast. Yes, fast. And obviously, you had nothing on scene that would have pointed you towards like no albuterol hanging out on the nightstand or anything. Correct. Okay. Yep. Because we just want to is. get out. Yeah. This is pre-COVID. We have masks on. We just want to get out of that smell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. just for um, education purposes, if she did, have, if you knew she had COPD, what would you change? Would you just be okay with those sats? Well, I would have gave her treatment. Mm-hmm. You know, started doing it. You know, she's still breathing. So what's I her rate? Thirties. Okay. Yeah. Thirties. So, so you would have. Helped fix her lungs, but she still has a decreased mentation. So you would still want to intubate. Well, saying? if no, if I do this over again, I would have gone to the hospital. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I'm just saying, <laughs> in this scenario, we didn't. Mm-hmm. Correct. So I'm just. So I'm yeah, just I knew that I had. A, you're still going to do high flow O2. You're high flow O2, and point. I knew that I had uh, my sats topped out at 89, 90, mm-hmm. and so I knew I would be pulling out 85. That was my number. That's why I told my partner, if I get to 85 on the sats, tell me and I'll pull out. And then let's just go over blood pressure too, because this is a huge one I think for RSI in the field. Is right. mm-hmm. we see that they don't have a very good respiratory drive, mm-hmm. altered mm-hmm. mental status, yep. and we need to intubate right away because that's first. Yep. Right. But it's really because that's airway, right? Airway comes right. before. But it's not because. Right. And then what's going to you know you intubate them, then that's going to change their all their mechanics. Right. right. Exactly. So now they're on right. positive pressure positive pressure ventilation, mm-hmm. rather than creating their own. Negative interthoracic pressure, right? Which is going to decrease their, you know, blood return it's to their heart. Yeah. So they're going to decrease their preload, and their their pressure yeah. is going to tank, Excellent. and they're going to go and into cardiac arrest. That, we're going to give them paralytics, yeah. which is also going to make their mm-hmm. blood pressure tank, yeah. right? So, um, and this lady's already got decreased preload, uh, probably because yeah. her she's probably so overexpanded. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's kind of a nightmare. Who needs to ask you questions when we have a Ramsey in the room? You know I mean? like, he can already predict what's going to happen. Like. <laughs> and hypotension, I think, before we really knew about 
don't yes. Know. But back in the day when we didn't really resuscitate or do anything, right. it was just intubate. Mm -hmm. Every time you push that sucks in your mind, you're like, well, here we this is gonna this isn't gonna be good, mm -hmm. you know. And then they code right yeah. because now yeah. you're taking away every ounce of adrenaline, the whole yeah. thing, right? Their veins aren't gonna squeeze anymore. No. We're paralyzed them mm -hmm. all. So yeah. anyway. So and I think that kind of up that now. positive intrathoracic pressure makes a big difference. I mean, you yeah, see that huge. even on BiPAP, right? Yeah. Like yeah. when people are in high settings on BiPAP, if their pressures aren't great, like the first thing I do is change their BiPAP settings, right? And their pressures will often turn around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, anyway. was I mean, BiPAP's a great option. It is, point. and you know, my vent has a good BiPAP option. Yeah, <laughs> right? I was going to say, I think I know yeah. your vents do. Yeah, yeah. they're it's good. It's okay. Good. All right. This is pre. Did you, did you guys have? Uh, BiPAP pre-COVID? We did. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It was sitting right there. Was you could have said no. We wouldn't have known. <laughs> no, no, fine. <laughs> Thanks I'm for your honesty. I'm just being super vulnerable yeah. right now. I'm thinking, I mean, the tires are yeah. probably just flat on the ambulance. That's why we're yeah. here. Yeah. yeah, you're waiting for another ambulance for to come pick ambulance. up your patient. I yeah. want them to get their money's worth in the back <laughs> yeah. of that ambulance. <laughs> like, this is medicine, right? Yeah. This yeah. is you're, medicine. The taxpayers yes. are getting their money's yes. worth yes. right now. That's but true. like, on, like this is how it goes when you practice medicine. Yeah. Like, it is a humbling thing to and do. And that's exactly what I was doing is practicing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is. I tell everybody that, like, emergency medicine, all medicine, but like, you guys and in the ER, it is a humbling thing to do. Because mm -hmm. yeah, when right. you mess, you're going to mess up. Mm -hmm. And when you mess up, and then look back through your, you know, mm -hmm. perfect little retroscope, and yep. things are very easy to see what you did wrong. It feels crappy. It does yeah, for it sure. Feels horrible. So, so where am give I? Give us well. So I get the blood pressure up. Yeah. Yep. It's almost dinner time, so I'm trying to get this expedited. Let's get it in the hospital. Right, because you want some food. Right. You're hungry. <laughs> You're for a long low. time. Yeah. Right? We only have a two-hour limit on that parking space in the right. in the parking lot. So. <laughs> to get a ticket. <laughs> so walk so, us through. What you did from here? So SATs topped out 89. Okay. We had it cut off 85. Uh, blood pressure got into the high high 80s, right? Okay. So Just with fluid? Fluid and norepi. And norepi, okay. Yeah, I think I was But at, they top out at like 8 mics, right? We were 12. We went to oh, 12. 12 mics, yep. yeah. But I could have called Just for still, more. Yeah. Could have called for more, but I didn't. Uh, and so now it's time to innovate. And also you can't fluid resuscitate a patient in 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Correct. So right. Go on, that's right. So... Uh, I did an amazing airway job on the airway. I got that two-per strike. Nice. Boom, just like that. Nice. Yeah. If we could stop right there, that'd be amazing. Yeah. But we can't. So what happened after you got the two? So we got the end title because we won confirmation, gold standard. Yeah. It was 100. Okay. 100. Yeah. Like I had never seen that before. Too many, too many end titles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too many. That's a yeah. lot, right? Yeah. And so what, I mean, I've already gone this like, far. And I've got some more shit to do. Yeah. I have got to get that end title down. Yeah. And how do you get end title down? Well, you can breathe fast. You breathe really fast, right? <laughs> yeah. And what does that do to someone who's on COPD, that has COPD? It uh, causes some, yeah. Did you yeah. drop a pneumo? What's that? Did she get a pneumo? Ooh, close. No, yeah. mm -hmm. no. I, I did have the foresight to take that thing, the the, the tube uh -huh. off the vent circuit. Oh, good. And, and Smart. But then I just keep thinking, okay, we got to get that rate up. Let's go. And then I start thinking, maybe I'll just call the hospital. Yeah, I mean, they're just. Good. I could probably just yeah. walk over there. And you could have yelled. <laughs> could have yelled from the open yell door. Yeah. The <laughs> but I got the doctor on the phone, and she was so nice. He, he said, "Okay, that's what I want you to do. Stop trying to fix the end title and just bring the patient to me, because that is a long process." Yeah. Right. It's and I was just sitting there, just trying and trying and trying to decrease that number. Yeah. So, can you explain to us why that number is so high? Yeah, I mean, so effectively this, so I'm, I'm getting the painting the picture now that this is a person that's kind of got a couple things going on, right? Mm -hmm. So they're probably potentially uroseptic, maybe they've got pneumonia, but has underlying COPD, right. it sounds like. Right. Do you know that yes. for de definitively now? Yes. Okay. Um, so her lungs are, it sounds like she's having also a COPD exacerbation. Correct. Right. Right. Which this is it's like. It's never just one thing. Yeah, it's no. Never one, <laughs> no. You know, it's funny. You go through like training and it's like Occam's razor. It's always one, thre one thing. And right. And then you get into practice and they call it like Hickam's dictum or whatever it is. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like 20, there's like three things going on. And like, so this right. lady's got multiple things going on. Yep. Um, so, but because of her, C just dealing with the airway stuff, like because of her COPD, she is not. She is somebody that can't ventilate, right? So she can't breathe off enough CO2. So her lungs are holding on and getting hyperexpanded. 
and you thinking you need to go up on the rate is just making all that worse. Right. Right. So now she's just stacking and breast stacking and breast stacking. Yes. But I mean, it's the, you did the right thing and taking her off the circuit, pushing on her Push chest. On chest. It was probably like a bunch of squeaky air came out. Yeah. And, it was. and then you started over and then overinflated her again. <laughs> Here we go again. Pushed on her <laughs> chest again. Yeah. Yeah. But, and that goes back to your original point where yeah. if you overinflate the chest under positive pressure, now you're decreasing venous return to the heart mm -hmm. and now your yeah. blood pressure is probably lower yeah. yep. and you're maxed out on your norepi and yeah. your fluids. And but so, that's a tough, and again, like that is a, that's a tough patient to manage on a vent or right. on a bag or whatever. But I mean, she never got to that point. Yeah. I'm close to the hospital just because I'm a paramedic doesn't mean I have to do all yeah. my paramedic skills in one, one mm -hmm. call. Right. So, mm -hmm. what was the handoff to the hospital like? It was embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you got the two. <laughs> I got the two. Um, well, the doc that I talked to received, and so I just kind of went over the whole thing, and uh, she did some stuff. We talked afterwards. She was super cool. Just kind of gave me a little education, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of reset me, mm -hmm. reframed the whole thing. Yeah, we've yeah. got a couple docs where we drop patients off to right now that. They do an excellent job of like, hey, before you leave, let me yeah, that let me chat so with helpful. you real quick. And it's it's super helpful. There are people though that can't see past the educational opportunity, and like they just look at it as like, oh, this person's coming down on me, and it's like, I I'm not, I don't know where that that mindset comes from. Like know. you are not the top person on this totem pole. No, like, there are smarter people than you, mm -hmm. and you need to like just sit and listen. And it, you know, like Ramsey said, it's a humbling experience, but you have so to beneficial. get better. I mean, yeah. you're there to serve people, so learn and get better. Exactly. But. And we've all screwed up, and that's why you're telling the story, mm -hmm. um, so other people can learn about it. And I do think that there is that internal pressure, though, to be perfect, because paramedics are scrutinized a lot by the, you know, when they drop off the patient at the ER, it's, and then you get your charts reviewed, and then... Why didn't you do this, all of this perfectly in the 10 or 20 or hour long time you have this patient? And like what Francis yep. is saying is, it takes a really long time to fix these people, sometimes days or weeks. Mm -hmm. We don't really need to do it in the first 15 minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. But we do have that internal pressure. Just because and, we can doesn't mean we need to. Yeah, but why Why did you want to fix all the numbers before you got to the ER? Because that's your job? Because you had internal pressure to do it? Because you wanted uh, to look good? Look good. Because I knew that 100 wasn't right, it's supposed to be 35 to 45. Yeah. And so I got to get that down. I'll have yeah. that down by the time I get to the hospital. Yeah. Two miles away. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably not, it hasn't been down in 20 years. Right, exactly. <laughs> it was for that little bit, yeah. though. Yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. But. but that's part of the reason we chase the numbers, because yeah. we want to look good. Yeah. We want to mm -hmm. look good. And that ego part is really hard yeah. to overcome. I mean, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, though. Like. I feel like what I'm like I was talking about earlier, docs and nurses, more than anything, they want a really thorough story. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. that helps them make so many decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. And they don't want cool dude, you got an IV, like thumbs up. Like mm -hmm. nobody cares. Like right. what they want is what did you find? What were you called for? Right. What's their history? And what did you do, if anything, to, you know, make any improvements? Yeah. But it's I don't know. Point, sir. Take that where you want, I guess, but yeah, it's a lesson some people need to learn more than others, I think. Are you looking at me when you say that? No, I'm oh. looking at like all of us, like in EMS, <laughs> okay. like, like we get in our own way right so me. much, you know, like, <laughs> we can be so cocky at times. But. Oh yeah. I mean, it takes a little bit of cockiness to be able to do the job. Oh yeah, we're all type A control yeah. freaks, so yeah. you have to be, you know, on that end of the spectrum for sure. But, yeah, but having the, like you know, you telling the story is great. Right? So yeah, people can learn that these things happen, and when it yep. happens to them, and it's okay, gonna, right? It's okay as long as you learn from it. Yeah. One yeah. of my one of my favorite things about Dan is how vulnerable he'll be with the mistakes he's made in the field and the way he uses that to educate. Other A people. little too vulnerable sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe hold back some of those details, yeah. <laughs> like dinner. You know, <laughs> I I just did the talk over in Idaho, and I did the uh, it's called Egos and Airways, but it's like a revised version. And it's Eagles and Airways, the, the mismanagement of airway management. And it's about my journey over the last 30 years and the, the problems I've had and mm -hmm. some of the issues I've caused and maybe deaths I've caused. Mm -hmm. um, and, but at the end, I had an old lady give me this hug and this dude was crying. So, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was yeah. 
you know, you being vulnerable good. sometimes and just admitting your mistakes is okay. That's how we're ending this podcast, right? Hugs and crying. Hugs yeah. and crying. <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah. Well, we're there. We've we've hit our we did it. Our, our episode. Um, thank you to Ramsey for, like for joining us, man. Yeah, yeah we I know. Just keep hanging well, out. I know. I'm having yeah. you here. I just yeah. want to like. Pick well, cool. <laughs> we'll leave it there. And uh, yeah, thanks again yeah. to Ramsey for joining us. Thanks for having us. Awesome super fun. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Fun. yeah. yeah. real good. We'll catch you guys on the next one.